For Kruma Media's Policy, I'm Sashni Mudli. Researcher and analyst Professor Raymond Sutner joins me to discuss what is ethical politics. Welcome, Professor. Thank you. Is it possible to have ethical politics? You know, I think uh, a lot of people are cynical about politics, uh, partly because of what they see in South Africa. But in general, I think people see politics as a dirty game. And I don't think politics is one thing. Historically, politics in South Africa has been many things over time. And in the past, inside the ANC, the sort of uh, possibility of ethical politics as I saw it as a participant was the only politics that was going. Now I was naive perhaps, but first of all, you have to have opportunities for unethical politics before you can practice unethical politics. I'm not saying even in illegal politics that there's not competition for resources, what resources there are, opportunities that there are, but in the early years of the ANC, it, people joined the organization and they had very little to look forward to except getting a very good smack and um, getting locked up, tortured, uh, even killed. Now, what I think has happened in more recent times is that people have had opportunities uh, for enrichment. Now that was there before, under the apartheid regime, there was a lot of corruption and uh, also the politics was unethical in the sense of dehumanizing of people. What is very, very hard to understand is how the same people now, the ANC, who fought, who sacrificed much of their life to make a better life for the oppressed people of South Africa are doing things that are actually attacks on those very people. So everything seems to run against the possibility of there being an ethical politics. And um, I, I know from studying people's lives that there are people in history who have uh, had ethical political lives like Mandela, Sisulu, Tambo, uh, Gandhi, in my view. Although Gandhi is controversial with some people, but I, I disagree with some of the reasoning. Now, what I try to do in this article is to distinguish between an ethical discussion regarding whether it's right or wrong to do X or Y. In other words, uh, what Plato, Socrates, Aristotle are, are, are dealing with is what is the good life mainly, or the Arist a lot of the Aristotle stuff is more practical about constitutions, things like that. But a lot of the discussion is really for philosophers to debate and there is no intention of acting it out. So there are two elements to evaluating ethical conduct. First of all is what is ethical conduct in a particular situation? Is it possible? I do believe it's possible. The second one is how do people come to the condition where they decide that they will act in a way that is ethical? Now in my own life I asked myself why I did certain things and didn't do certain things and I tried to understand it. And I didn't really want to make this autobiographical. So what I did is that I took Lutuli's life and I explained how he is, was a Christian and it's possible to interpret your Christianity in a number of different ways. Some people focus on the afterlife, some people focus on their private life, like it's said that you can pray in a closet, you see. Now what that is essentially private notion 
of your relationship with God and with the Lord, with Christ, whoever. Now, what Lutuli concluded at a certain part time of his life, that his Christianity was no longer a private affair, but it had to benefit all human beings, because all human beings are made in the image of God. Uh, and that led him to take actions which increased in the demands that they made on him. Uh, at first, when he took that decision, I don't think he envisaged uh, going into politics and being deposed as a chief. And he made a statement there and he said, I don't know what lies ahead of me. Maybe it is banishment, ridicule, or even death. All I know is that some families and people must be prepared to make sacrifice. The road to freedom is via the cross. In other words, he foresaw the possibility of death. In the case of Gandhi, he also was engaged in what he saw as inquiries in the pursuit of truth, finding his own truth through actions in his life. And in the course of doing this, he strengthened his will to act in a way that he thought was right. He, in other words, he didn't just say, OK, this is right, I will do it. But he recognized that temptations could arise to stop you from acting out what you believe is right. So he swore various vows. When he went to England to become a barrister, uh, in about in the 1880s or 1890s, um, his mother didn't want him to go uh, because she said, you know, they eat meat there and all that sort of thing. So he made a vow that he wouldn't eat meat. And I think the vows in Hinduism and in other religions are very important. And they also, you can see their importance in the struggle in South Africa. For example, uh, in the defiance campaign, they swore a vow. In joining MK, you undertook an oath uh, in order to carry out activities in a particular way. So I think it is possible, but it's, a, it's really a subjective thing. And I don't know how to convince other people to act it out. Or I try just to keep myself on the straight and narrow. And I think it is definitely possible. I'm saying at a subjective level. At an objective level, we can say some things have been better than others. Even if people agree on what is right in politics, how do we get them to do that? Um, you know, when people agree, you can't always be sure that the same words are given the same meaning by everyone. So that, you know, acting out something is like trench warfare. You agree on this, and then you have to fight over doesn't mean this, doesn't mean that. For example, um, if uh, there was a blockage at a certain point in the struggle, was it legitimate to take up arms? Is there an absolute policy of non-violence as people like Gandhi believed in, although Gandhi did have his exceptions? Now, in general, you've got to have a combination of understanding. People, have, people who are going to act on the basis of an idea must understand it in the same way. They must understand the course of action they're going to undertake in the same way. But I believe for there to be this ethical element that keeps them on the path, you need not just intellect. It can't just be Cerebrali cerebralization of ethics it also has to be compassion and passion. You've got to feel empathy, connectedness with the people whose plight you are going to advance, and you may be amongst those people. Uh, secondly, you have to f have the passion to carry it out in your life in various ways, uh, which is not to say that people won't retreat because what I think has happened in the case of when I was referring to the ANC who 
had nothing to look forward to in the days of apartheid except being beaten up in the main. Now, many pe some people had better opportunities there. But what's happened after 1990 is people have come back and they've entered into different types of relationships whereby they can earn much more and all of this. And they have responsibilities towards family, relatives, all these sorts of things. And I think sometimes in patronage relationships, uh, getting the, more, the, the money is in exchange for something. And they have had to negotiate in their minds whether this exchange, which entails a relationship of loyalty to someone or even something that attacks the rights of the oppressed people in general, whether that is justified by the benefits that they get for themselves, but also for their relatives and family. So I think it's, it's a really complicated issue. All I can do is try and open up the debate, and that's what I've tried to do. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. That was Professor Raymond Sattner speaking to Creamer Media's policy about ethical politics.